Whatever you have going on in your life, we are here to encourage you that Jesus is enough. It's the basis of everything we do here at Hope Community Church. Everything that we sing, everything that we say, everything that we do is to point to the truth that you may feel very far from God, but he is never far from you and you can find your ultimate hope in him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give him some praise, church. And you guys can have a seat. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 this morning as we conclude our series called Unsocial Media. Now, if you're just joining, joining us, haven't been with us the past three weeks, we've been going through this series called Unsocial Media. And um, we decided to do a series around the idea of social media because whether we like it or not, social media is a centerpiece of our society. And with all of its pros and all of its cons, social media is really at the forefront of many of our relationships. I remember whenever I, I first saw Rachel, I didn't get a chance to meet her in person right away, but before I ever got a chance to talk to her in person, what was the first thing I did? I looked her up on Facebook. <laughs> you know, later she would tell me that's weird, I should have looked her up on Instagram, but I guess I'm behind the times. <laughs> and then once I gathered together the courage and the fortitude, I finally sent her a friend request. <laughs> and she accepted. <laughs> And I knew I was in there whenever she, on her own volition, followed me on Instagram. And I remember I about crashed into Wendings when I saw the notification pop up on my phone. I was trying to get it and follow her back. Moral of that story is don't gram and drive. <laughs> don't, I probably shouldn't have even told you that. But <laughs> let me be clear. We did not do any communication on social media before we communicated in person. There was none of that sliding in the DMs nonsense, okay? We didn't get into that. But if I'm going to be honest, I used to post a lot of stories on Instagram. And the only reason I would post it is because I wanted to see if she saw it. And she did. She saw every single one. <laughs> And I would like her post and she would like mine and we both knew it. And whenever we got to the point where we actually got to talk in person, all I did was I asked her a few questions I already knew the answer to, mainly because of social media. Now, I knew I knew the answers to these questions. She knew I knew the answers to those questions, but we still went throughout the formality of the small talk before I asked her out and the rest is history. We get married in two weeks. <laughs> it still worked. Thank you. But, you know, I find it funny that once we started dating and the, and the longer we got into our relationship, the less and less that I felt the need to post. Because before, I was just posting a lot. I would post like five or six stories a day, but the only reason why is because I wanted her to see it. Because in reality, I was marketing myself. And that's really what social media has turned into. It's a, it's a marketing strategy, and the product that we're selling is ourselves. And with how widespread and how mainstream social media has become, it's a very competitive market. And because of that, it's very easy to fall into the entrapment of comparison. Now, let me be clear. Social media is not the devil. Social media is actually an awesome advancement in our society, and it can be used for incredible things. And, and we, we're not here to bash social media, because in reality is we're not going to be able to change what people post, how they post, when they post. But what we can control is the way that we see what's in, what is posted. And what I want to explore here this morning is how can we go from a life that is filled with comparison to a life that is full and content? How do we get to the point where we can be more like Paul? Like he said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for these moments that we have as a community gathered around your word. And I pray right now in this moment that all the distractions and stress of life would cease right now as we focus on you and your goodness and your love. I thank you that we don't have to ask you to fill this place with your presence because we know you're already here. But Father, I pray that we would become much more aware of your presence. And I pray that you would make us a little bit more like you here this morning. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You're just on another vacation. Wow, so happy for you. Smiley face emoji. Funny how the words you type don't reveal the jealousy you actually feel. There he is, your new brother-in-law. You like him. 
He's one of those guys who always smells good. His five o'clock shadow is always at five o'clock. You like him. Your mom says he's done really well for himself. He has stocks and bonds. Your dad wants to go fishing with him. Your dad doesn't even like fishing. You like your brother-in-law, but you'd like him better if you made more money than he does. <laughs> She's staying in a rainforest treehouse? That's my dream. You dream big for a man on a plane to Omaha. And she's ziplining with little John? What? It's Lil John. Even he knows that. Thanks, Captain Obvious. You're with Big John. I'm Steve. Don't hate like their trip. So you guys do think that's funny too. It's not just me. <laughs> you know, and as I love those commercials, and as hilarious as those commercials are, I think we can agree that they're onto something. You see, these companies, they advertise the way that they do because they understand the way that we think. And I, and I love that phrase that the Hotels.com commercials with Captain Obvious uses. He says, don't hate like their trip. Go book your own. <laughs> And when I think about it, you think about how many times we hate like things, or you know the people that are always hate liking something. Now, I've shared this story before, but um, I remember I was sitting with a couple of guys, and uh, they were both scrolling through Instagram, and at one point, one guy picks up his phone, and he's like, oh, look at this. He came across like a couple post, and so this couple posted a picture, he's like, oh, look, this is so gross. Uh. Austin Miller thinks this was him, but I'm not sure it was him, but it probably could be. And... And he's just sitting there bad mouthing the post. And as he's sitting there complaining about the post, he double taps it. I'm saying like, how are you gonna be sitting here hating on their post and still give a little Insta heart, bro? Like, what's the matter with you? And, but the reality was he didn't hate the post. He just hated that he wasn't in the post. He wanted to be able to put up a post like that, but he wasn't in that season of life right then. So he just hate likes the post himself. But how often do we hate like things? Because it's, a tale as old as time. Yes, that's a Disney line. I've been watching a lot of Disney Plus lately. Don't judge me. Uh, but everybody wants what they don't have, don't they? So whenever we see something that someone else has or what someone else does and the way that, we, the way that they do it, we compare them to ourselves and more often than not, we end up getting discouraged. It's when we fall in this entrapment of Comparison. And this morning, real quick here at the beginning, I want to look through three dangers of comparison. Now, I will give you a heads up that at this portion in the sermon, my alliteration game is on point. I will make Pastor Skip very proud. <laughs> the three dangers of comparison. And the first one is comparison kills contentment. The researchers did a study not too long ago where they went to two different universities and they gathered a group of students and they did this study where they would have each student individually go into a room by themselves and spend 30 minutes on Facebook. That's all they would do. And then after they had spent 30 minutes on Facebook, they would take them out and they would survey the way that they felt. And this study showed that one third of the students surveyed stated that they felt significantly depressed after spending only 30 minutes on Facebook, and they cited envy as the number one emotion that they felt. See, what we do is whenever we see what other people post and it looks so fun and so glamorous and so cute, and then we compare what looks so great in their posts to the mundane of our everyday lives, and we don't take into consideration how many takes how much editing, how many filters it took to make that post the way that it was. And we get so caught up because we fail to realize that we are comparing our behind the scenes to their highlight reel. And in turn, we become so discontent with where we are in life. And then we feel like that we have to post because we have to make people think that we're real exciting, glamorous, and cute. And in our attempt to make life seem more exciting than it is, we end up just getting more and more discontent with our lives. 
And it's so dangerous whenever we make it our goal to make our lives look like something that it's not in order to just impress other people. Drake addresses this in one of his songs, and I don't know if I'm supposed to quote Drake in church or not, but whatever. Here we go. He says in one of his songs that he, he talks about three different girls that he knows. And the first girl uh, that he knows said it was her lifelong dream to go to Rome. But when she got there, all she did was just post pictures for people back at home. And another girl he knew said that she took a bunch of pictures of places that she had been, and she would periodically post those pictures to make it seem like she was always on the go. But the third girl, he says, he knows, is happily married and puts down her phone. You know, it is possible to be so appreciative and content with the life that we have that we don't feel the need to get caught up in comparing our lives to others and just appreciate where we are. But the longer we play the comparison game, the less and less content we will be. The next danger of comparison is that comparison creates contention. Comparison will not only kill the contentment that we have in our life, it will damage the relationships that we have. And this happens whenever we make comparison a competition. Now, comparison doesn't always have to be a competition. We can actually use comparison for encouragement where we look at someone else's life that's just like us and they're doing great things and we use that to be motivated and find encouragement by their story and their life as we appreciate what's happening in their life. But more often than not, that's not the comparison we get caught up in because more often than not, our comparison leads us to be bitter and resent people. And a red flag to notice if this is something that you struggle with is that as soon as something good happens for somebody else and your first reaction is, well, how come that doesn't ever happen to me? And if we're honest, we can probably think of a person or two in our lives that we just absolutely can't stand. And the only reason why we can't stand them is because everything seems to go their way. That's it. That's the only reason. Think about this. Imagine you're coming home from work one day and you see your neighbor in the driveway and they look very like dazed and confused. Now you have a good relationship with this neighbor so you walk up to them and say, hey, is everything okay? They say, man, my, my aunt just died. Oh man, were you guys close? Yeah, we were pretty close. She left me $2 million. I guarantee your response is not gonna be, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. <laughs> More, if we're honest, more often than not, we're going to be like, well, I want a rich aunt who dies. Why doesn't that ever happen to me? <laughs> and you might say, oh, Kenny, you're horrible, but be honest. And the longer it goes on, the longer it's going to eat at you. Because a few days later, you go home and you see your dream car in their driveway. And then over the coming months, you have to listen to the sound of construction as they're putting add-ons to their home that you've always wanted to do. And over time, someone that you had a good relationship with, now all of a sudden, just the sound of their voice is like nails on a chalkboard. Now, this might be an extreme example, but if we're honest, we can probably think of some similar situations in our lives. The person that got the promotion over you. The person that always seems to be the life of the party instead of you. All the people getting married whenever you're still single. All the exotic vacations people are posting about when you're just trying to make it to Myrtle Beach once every other year. And the sad thing is, is we compare our situation to theirs that we allow it to drive a wedge between what could actually be a really good friendship. And we allow this comparison to create contention in our lives. We develop rivalries with people that aren't even giving us a second thought. Because comparison creates contention. The last danger is comparison can control your life. Now, don't miss this. Because not only can we get caught up comparing ourselves to others, but we can also get caught up wanting to live a life where other people will compare themselves to us. Because if we're not careful... It is very easy to fall into a life that is driven not by purpose or calling, but our sole motivation will be to try to live in life that, that we think other people will be envious of. Because we know how envious we get whenever we compare ourselves to certain people, so we want the satisfaction of having other people compare themselves to us and feel like they don't live up to our standards. It's diabolical. 
This is why James says in chapter 3, verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. This is so evil and so diabolical because the continual comparison that leads to envy and selfish ambition will never get us to where we want to be. It will give us the illusion that we're inching closer to where we want to be, but we'll never actually get there. We will never be satisfied. We'll never be content. I've heard it said that never before in all of human history have people had so much and yet still want so much more. So we're not content. Gary Thomas states in his book, Authentic Faith, there's never enough excitement to quiet the human heart. We'll never have as much excitement as we want. This has been true since the beginning of time. It's what happened to Adam and Eve, wasn't it? So the question is, how do we quiet the heart? How do we loose the grip that comparison has on our life? How do we learn to be content? Because Paul states in our passage this morning, he said, I have learned the secret of being content. It's important to note that Paul says contentment is something that can be learned, which is also to say that contentment does not come to us naturally. You see it in children. And a child can be so content with a toy that they've been given until they see another child with another toy, right? And then all of a sudden, the toy they have isn't good enough. All they want is that toy that that child has. It'd be nice if we could outgrow that, wouldn't it? But you probably heard it said, the only difference between the men and the boys is the price of their toys, right? Paul says, this doesn't come natural. It has to be learned. And one of the biggest things, probably one of the most important things that Paul learned in his life is that contentment is not found in what you have, but in who you know. Contentment's not found in what you have, but in who you know. He says in chapter 3, verse 8, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And this means a lot coming from Paul. Because in the beginning of chapter 3, Paul starts listing off all of the things that would have made him the who's who in the Jewish society. And he said if anyone had the ability to boast in who they were and what they had, it was him. Because back in the day, Paul was a prodigy. And Paul was on pace to be the LeBron James of the Pharisaical world. He was like a boy genius. He studied under all of the right teachers. He was around all of the right people. He had everything going for him to fast track his way up the social ladder. He was the next big thing. Because back in that day, the celebrities weren't the artists and and athletes and actors. The celebrities were the rabbis, the Pharisees, the religious teachers. They had all the power, all of the influence, and all the fame. And Paul was on pace to be the biggest one since Moses. There comes a point in time where there starts to be some buzz going around town. See, Paul, he had heard about this guy named Jesus. He never met him personally, but he was glad whenever he heard that they crucified him because he was causing a ruckus and turning all the people against the Pharisees. And then just a few days after they crucified him, he starts to hear this rumor. There's a bunch of crazy people going around town spreading this rumor that Jesus had risen from the dead. And now they're saying that Jesus was the Messiah, their savior, their deliverer that the people had been waiting for for generations. But Paul, he's famous for his religious knowledge, and he had studied what he thought the Messiah was supposed to be like, and Jesus was nothing like what he and the other Pharisees had been taught about the Messiah in their studies. So Paul and his guys, they're going to go shut these Jesus people up. They're going to restore the religious order and get things back to normal. So they start going around arresting anyone who claims Jesus as Lord. They're tearing families apart. They're throwing people in jail. They're even killing some of them. Paul himself, he oversaw the stoning of a man named Stephen. Stephen was going around preaching Jesus as Lord, and somehow he was performing a lot of these signs and wonders. And the Pharisees had enough of him So they dragged him out of the city and Paul held their coats while they crushed his head with big rocks until he was dead. And Paul, he feels like he's on a roll. 
And so he goes and he gets permission to go down to a town called Damascus and round up and arrest more Christians or worse. And while he was on the way there, Paul, formerly known as Saul, he's heading down to Damascus to kill more Christians and all of a sudden a light shines from heaven. He gets thrown to the ground and he hears a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus who you persecute. Now, get up, go into the city, you'll be told what to do. Now, everybody else that's with Paul at that moment are dumbfounded because they hear the voice too, but they don't see anybody. And Paul picks himself up and he realizes he's completely blind and he has to be led by the hand into the town. He gets there, he doesn't eat, drink, sleep for three days. And during that time, Jesus talks to a man named Ananias through a vision. And Ananias goes and he finds Paul and he prays for him. And Paul receives his sight back. And Paul begins this journey on finding out who Jesus really is. And the more that he gets to know Jesus, the more he realizes that there is nothing else that can even compare to being worth as much as Jesus. And in the beginning of chapter 3, when he's listing off his resume, all the accolades that would have made him the who's who in the Jewish world, and then he gets to verse 7 and he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so I could gain Christ. Man, what makes Jesus so great that all of the accolades he could have ever wished to achieve in this life were seen as garbage? No. Oh. Paul was captivated with the truth that the God who created him put on skin and bone and came to the planet and allowed himself to be brutally murdered and tortured on a cross so that the sin and the selfishness that had separated him from God could be paid for and he could live free in the love and the acceptance of God as his child. Paul understood that Jesus is worth everything because he made me worth something. And that's where Paul found his contentment. And the people in Philippi would have, seen, would have seen Paul live out this contentment firsthand. See, whenever Paul first got to Philippi, the first person he ran into was a businesswoman named Lydia. Lydia, she was in the fashion industry. She was a seller of purple. She made royal clothes. She did very well for herself. And if she wasn't living in luxury, she was very close to it. But Paul, even in the midst of all that abundance... Paul still found himself completely content ministering to and loving on the people in that situation. Now you might say, well, of course, that's easy to be content in that situation. But even when his environment changed, his contentment did it. Shortly after that, Paul's walking around town and he has a demon-possessed slave girl that's annoying him. So he casts out the demon from the slave girl. Now the owners get mad because this demon would predict future things that would make them a lot of money. So now this slave girl didn't have his demon anymore. They were out of money, so they get mad. They have Paul arrested. They have him severely beaten and thrown in a Roman prison. And there, the Roman jailers put him in stocks. And these stocks weren't like this head and arms thing that you see on TV. These stocks where you put your body in weird, awkward positions that would intentionally make your body seize up and cramp up so you would be in continual excruciating pain. And even in the midst of that, Paul is still so content with his situation that all he does is sing praise songs all night long. And at some point around midnight, in the middle of his worship set, all of a sudden the jail shakes, all the stocks and the chains, they fall off of him and all the prison doors swing wide open. But Paul is still so content with his situation that he doesn't make a run for it. He stays right where he is and he makes everybody else stay where they are too. And so when the jailer comes back and he sees all the prison doors open, he assumes everybody escaped. So he takes out a sword to kill himself, but Paul stops him. And he talks with him. And that night, that jailer and his entire household are saved and baptized. Paul was so content and confident in the message of the gospel that his original church planning team for the church he would go on to say was the most generous church he'd ever been a part of. His original planning team was a businesswoman, a slave girl, and a Roman jailer. All of this going to show that it doesn't matter what you have, where you come from, or what you do. All that matters is Christ. 
Did you know that you can be content even when everything seems to be going wrong? Did you know we can actually be more content if we learn to live with our circumstances rather than constantly trying to change them? Even Paul, as he's writing this letter, is writing this from a Roman prison where he's awaiting a possible death sentence. But yet he's still so content that he writes in the first chapter, in chapter 12, and verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul understood that contentment is not a state of condition. It's a state of heart. It's a state of mind. See, Paul understood how to live more like a thermostat than a thermometer. You understand the difference? A, a, therm, a thermometer is changed. It goes up and it goes down based on the temperature of the environment that it's in. But a thermostat, on the other hand, stays in the same environment, but it is not changed by the temperature of that environment, but it actually dictates what the temperature is going to be. Come on, did you know that you do not have to be a product of your environment? But through your attitude, through your heart, through your choice to be content, you can actually dictate what the effect your circumstances are going to have on you. But Paul says this has to be learned. This doesn't just come from saying a prayer, accepting Jesus, and all of a sudden you get it. No, it takes work. It takes discipline. This, takes, this is a process throughout the process of sanctification. But Paul lets us know that this is possible. He says in verse 11 and 12, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He said, I learned the secret. And what are some things that we can do to learn and develop this contentment in our lives? So today I close, I just want to go through a few characteristics of contentment that we can apply to our lives and some things that we can work on. And the first one is that, that the content remember to rejoice. He says in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, it's the realization of what you already have. See, and the most content people are the ones that are less content with the gifts and more content with the giver. And James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. This is why the most content people are also the most generous people, because they realize that this life and everything we have in it is a gift so we can just rejoice. We can sit back and just rejoice looking out over creation. I don't need anything else to find fulfillment in my life. The content realize that even when I have nothing in this world, I have everything I could ever need in Jesus because he gives me eternal worth. And this life is just a vapor. And I can rejoice that God has given me purpose and meaning and mission. And you know, I can be so much more content in life rejoicing than I can be complaining. Do you agree? Remember to rejoice. The next one is the content celebrate others. Pastor Greg Laurie states, contentment does not come from seeking self-fulfillment, but rather the fulfillment of others. You know, the most lonely life you could ever possibly live is a life that is solely fixated on yourself. And I'm telling you, we would be so much more content, fulfilled, and satisfied with life if we learned to stop comparing ourselves to others and started celebrating them instead. You know, it's possible to look at someone's vacation post and just be happy for them. It's possible to be happy for a couple at their wedding rather than just judging their ceremony and decorations the whole time. It's possible to want more for other people than you do for yourself. And you know what? Not only would celebrating others help you be more content in your own life, but it would also make you a much more pleasant person to be around and more people would want to be your friend. Just saying. Learn to celebrate others. The next one is the content understand the power of prayer. In verse 6, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Prayer is the antidote to anxiety. Prayer is how we turn our anxiety into peace. And this is nothing new. David essentially said the same exact thing in Psalm 37, 4, when he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this doesn't mean if I get right with God, all of a sudden I'm gonna start getting everything that I want. Keep in mind that delight comes before the desire. Paul says thanksgiving comes before the request. Because it's whenever I spend intimate time with God, I take every situation to him, thanking him for everything that he is and everything he's already given me. And then I present my request to him. All of a sudden, I'll begin to notice that my desires begin to line up with his desires. Because my heart begins to line up with his heart. And I start to see things the way I'm supposed to. And I, in turn, find peace. Have you ever had that situation whenever you're freaking out about something and then when you take the time to actually just pray about it, all of a sudden you have more of a peace about the situation even though the situation hasn't changed? Has that ever happened to you? I can tell you from personal experience in my own life, I find it interesting how increasingly patient I become with the people I actually pray for, especially with the ones I don't want to be patient with, <laughs> the ones I'm irritated with and don't want to pray for. All of a sudden I start to become more Patient with them. It's like Pastor Craig Rochelle once said that my prayer for other people may not always change them, but it'll always change me if I understand the power of prayer. We'll become so much more content. And this will help us with the next characteristic, which is the content to develop the proper perspective. He says in verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whether, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. How much more content would we be if we stopped looking for things to complain about and started looking for things to praise? But so often our conversations, our attention, the news are spent on what's wrong and negative with the world. Now, we shouldn't ignore those things, but we would be much better served if we would spend more energy on celebrating things that are true, noble, pure, right, and lovely. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves is whenever I hear people talking about this generation going to hell in a handbasket. You know, and, and you hear people talk about, oh, this is a, we're in a post-Christian generation, you know, things are so bad, things have gotten so far gone, but yet... Christian music has never been bigger than, it, than it's ever been in history. It's on, it's on mainstream. Whenever Elevation, Hillsong, Kanye, you know, put out these Christian albums, they're rivaling anyone else in the music industry. I see millions of people flocking to church in a new way. You know, like, I see never before in history have we seen 60 to 70,000 college students gathering together just to praise Jesus like we see at Passion every single year. We're living in incredible times. And, you know, people think about all these things that the world is throwing at us. And, yeah, like we're in a generation that has more options than ever before. But a choice is powerful in the midst of many options, not in the midst of no options. And so when we have those people who choose Jesus over everything else the world is offering right now, that just makes that choice that much more powerful. So no, I'd rather focus on what's praiseworthy and excellent and what God is doing in this generation than looking at everything that seems to be wrong. I'll get down off my soapbox now. <laughs> I didn't say that in the first service. <laughs> you know, I, I was, when I was here, when I preached here the last time, I think it was the last time I preached here, I talked about you replicate what you celebrate. So therefore, if we would learn to celebrate more, we would in turn live a life worth celebrating. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. See, the content learn how to keep themselves in check whenever getting caught up in pointless arguments, debates, or opinions. See, we need to learn how to take our thoughts captive. So whenever we see that post and we start to compare and resent, we take that thought captive and we celebrate that person instead. Whenever we start to get anxious, we can take that thought captive and then instead praise and pray. And whenever we start to complain, we can take that thought captive and remember to rejoice. And in doing so, we begin to mold our minds into having the proper perspective of contentment. 
Uh, the last characteristic that I want to look at here this morning is that the content rely on the power of God. How freeing would it be if we realized that we don't have to live this life on our own power? I don't have to rely on my own power in order to live a content life. But Paul clearly states what the secret of being content is. He says, I've learned the secret of being content, and the secret is this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, but also one of the most taken out of context verses in the Bible. Because keep in mind that the all things include some pretty hard things. Don't get caught up taking this verse out of context. So many people do this. We think that the all things are just supposed to be all of the good things that benefit us, that we want to do. And we use this verse as some sort of fairy pixie dust to try to get what we want and say, oh, I'm going to get a raise because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what if you don't get that raise? Is he still strong? What, 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 if, what about the person who got a pay cut? Can they still do all things through Christ who strengthens them? Oh, I'm going to get that dream job because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What if God decides he can better use you in a different occupation? Is he still good? Oh, I'm going to make it to the NFL because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't want to limit the power of God, but bro, you're like 5'2", 111 pounds. I don't think you're the next Luke Keekly. Just saying. Is he still good? See, Philippians 4.13, it's not about me being able to do whatever I want to do with some of God's help on the side. But it's about the power of God sustaining me, fulfilling me, and making me content with whatever season of life that I'm in. Paul is saying, oh, I can get a raise. I can live in abundance, but I don't need it because it's Christ that strengthens me. He's all that matters. Or I can have absolutely nothing to my name, but I still have everything I could ever possibly need in Jesus because it's Christ who strengthens me. That's why the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Because contentment is not found in what you have, but in who you know. And I firmly believe with all of my being that true contentment is found in the presence of God because you can be content in what is consistent and there is nothing more consistent than the power and the presence and the love of God who was the same yesterday, today, and forever, who holds the stars in his hands, whose word endures forever, whose love is everlasting, who is the great I am. This God promises to never leave you or forsake you. This God God is enough. He's enough because he's good. He's good because he's gracious. He's gracious because he's loving. He's loving because he's God. It's who he is. And there's nothing that you and I could ever do to change who he is. There's nothing you could ever do to make him leave you. Now, there may be times where you go away from him, but he's never going to go away from you. He's consistent. His love never changes. And there's nothing you could ever do to make him love you any more or any less. Man, I remember years ago hearing a young teenage girl say at youth on a Wednesday night, man, whether you believe in him or not, he's still madly in love with you. Let's be content in that love. Let's stop getting caught up comparing what other people have, what other people do, what other people post. Let's just start comparing everything we experience to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can we do that? You guys pray with me again, dear Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that we can be content in your presence. And Lord, right now I pray over all of my brothers and sisters in this room that we would look to you like never before. I pray that we would see everything on social media in our everyday lives, the people that you love beyond measure. I pray we would see these things through the filter of your love. I pray that you, we would take every thought captive to make it obey Christ, to reflect your heart. And Lord, I pray that you would mold us and shape us so that we could truly learn the secret of being content. 
Thank you that your love sustains us. Thank you that your power carries us. And I pray for each and every one of my brothers and sisters in this room, I pray we would not take a single step in this life without relying on you. I pray we would realize that you are all we need because you are all we have. Lord God, you are holy, holy, holy. You are Lord, you are God, you are almighty. Without you, we are nothing. And in you, we have everything. Oh, Father, I pray for those in this room right now that have never accepted your love. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would start to do some of that heart surgery that Pastor Jeremy talked about. Lord, I pray they would not leave this room today without filling out that connect card, checking that they gave their life to Jesus talking with somebody. Oh, Father, I pray you change lives in this moment. I pray that you inhabit our praise. Thank you, Jesus, that you are enough. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand and worship?